um, and allow people to unmute themselves. All right. Well, thanks very much for, for having me on. I greatly appreciate it. So I've been asked to talk about uh, kind of the relationships between guns and crime. Um, and so I, I thought I'd start off uh, a little bit by just going through some graphs and other things that people see all the time and then kind of talk about how I think people should actually be looking at these, uh, these issues. So one of the common things you'll see, uh, I'll show you some graphs from uh, the New York Times and from Vox. One of the things that you'll very frequently see is uh, homicide rates by firearms per, you know, 100,000 or million people. <clears throat> this graph here, I hope you all can see it, is from Vox. It shows one, two, I think it shows like 14 countries where the United States has a lot more homicides uh, from firearms than, uh, than other countries do. Just... So people know, uh, I assume since you guys are all law students, you understand the difference between homicides and murders. Uh, homicides are murders uh, plus justifiable homicides. It's never really been obvious to me why one wants to lump those two things together. Uh, obviously, a murder, somebody who goes out and commits a robbery and, uh, and kills people uh, in the course of the robbery, uh, is obviously a bad situation. A woman uh, who, let's say, fatally shoots a rapist, a serial rapist who breaks into her home at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, you know, it'd be nice if people didn't die. But on the other hand, uh, there's a reason why we call uh, what she did justifiable. So, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, those, those are mixed together. You see here, this is from uh, Vox. You can see a similar graph from the New York Times. Uh, United States, this is per 100,000 people. Obviously, the United States is much higher than uh, these other uh, 10 countries that they're showing here. One of the questions that you have is why do you pick the set of countries that they do to make these types of comparisons? You know, some you may even see 20 countries uh, being compared. Uh, first of all, I'll show you developed countries in a minute, but uh, just to look at homicide rates across all countries, you can see here the average is in blue, uh, green is the median, so half the countries are above, half are below. The United States is in orange here. Uh, there are a couple things <clears throat> to kind of point out in this graph. Uh, first of all, um, not all countries uh, report homicide data. The vast majority do. But uh, the countries that don't report homicide data probably have among the highest homicide rates. There's a reason why they don't report it. The second thing is, uh, even the countries that do report it, I mean, this data is from the UN, uh, all they do is rely on the data from the individual countries. And there's a lot of false data that countries put out on not only homicide rates, but lots of other things about their countries. Um, you know, you take a country like Venezuela, for example. Uh, the official homicide rate in Venezuela uh, was 60 uh, homicides per 100,000 people. Well, uh, there are independent organizations that just simply counting up news stories uh, in newspapers uh, indicate that they believe that the homicide rate is over 100 per 100,000 people. But even that is probably a significant underestimate for two reasons. One is uh, there's simply so many homicides that are occurring in the country that the newspapers can't cover all the homicides that are there. Secondly, um, there's a lot of suppression of even what is covered. So, for example, in Venezuela, if you have a, uh, a relative who's killed uh, and you try to pick up the body from the morgue, if you have talked to the media, they won't release the body to you. And that's well known. And so people don't talk to the media uh, about uh, relatives who have been killed. And uh, different organizations, hospitals and stuff, won't talk to the media either because they don't want to make it so that the relatives can't pick up uh, 
the dead bodies of people that they're close to. And so you, you know, there are multiple reasons to believe that even that 100,000 plus per 100,000, or 100 homicides per 100,000, it underestimates it. And of course, it's not just Venezuela, uh, China, uh, many totalitarian countries uh, appear to dramatically underestimate crime rates and, uh, uh, and also just don't even report certain types of crimes. So there's uh, good reason to believe that there's a number of countries here that have actually much higher uh, homicide rates than they actually are shown in the official data. And as I mentioned, uh, homicides are murders plus justifiable homicides. Ideally, you'd want to go and make a comparison for murder rates across countries rather than homicide rates across countries. The problem is there are very few countries that report murder data. Um, and, uh, and that makes the United States look relatively worse than it is. About a, over 20% of our homicides are just fiable homicides when you add in just fumble, just fiable homicides by police and civilians. Um, and that data is pretty poorly done. Uh, anybody who kind of remembers the debate about justifiable homicides by police know that most police departments don't report that type of data. Uh, and the data is even worse when it comes to justifiable homicides by civilians. Uh, you may see that you know, 34, 35 states may technically report uh, uh, justifiable homicides by civilians. But the problem is, is that within those states, you may literally just have a few jurisdictions that report the data. And even the, even the places that do report the data have real problems because uh, uh, you may have uh, a death that occurs and it may not be determined in the courts until maybe two years or three years even later whether the, uh, whether the death was justifiable or not. And uh, police departments simply don't go back and correct the earlier data that they had. So there are lots of problems that we have with, with that data. But if, if we use kind of the best estimates that we have, that would lower the U.S. rate by about 20% or so relative to most other countries because it's pretty clear that the United States has the highest rate of justifiable homicides uh, in the world. So <clears throat> now one thing just to compare this with is how does the firearm homicide rate look across countries? Because you may have noticed in the graphs that I showed you from the New York Times and from Vox and I guarantee you the Washington Post or anybody else, what they're going to show you is going to be uh, firearm homicides. Um, and uh, that graph looks dramatically different than the graph that I just showed you a minute ago. Uh, if you look over here, you can see uh, the average is way up over here. Uh, the United States, though, is right here, pretty close to the average and well above the media. So how come, uh, if you look at this, how come when you're looking at total homicides, the United States is well below the average and, and below the, the median, even using uh, homicides as opposed to murders? But when you're looking at firearm homicides, the United States is well above the median here and pretty close to the average. Well, there's a simple reason for that. If you look at these two graphs, one thing that may be striking is how thin the lines are here compared to the lines here. And there's a simple reason for that, and that is almost all the countries report homicide data. Only about half the countries report firearm homicide data. And guess which countries don't report firearm homicide data? It's the countries with the highest homicide rates. So, I mean, if you just took a simple case here, let's say uh, uh, the countries with the, let's say the United States was right in the middle in terms of homicide rates. And the top half of the countries that have the highest homicide rates also have the highest firearm homicide rates, but they don't report the firearm homicide rates would make it look like the United States had the highest 
firearm homicide rate, even though we're we're at the average or below the average there. And uh, and it's so it's simply an artifact of the fact that half the countries don't report firearm homicides. You know, in the United States, we're used to all sorts of data being collected. That's not true in most of the world. A lot of the world, they just try to report the number of homicides. And one of the reasons why they report the number of homicides is it's a lot easier than them even trying to figure out whether something's justifiable or not. They just don't spend the time, they don't spend the resources uh, in uh, collecting the type of data. I mean, we have, we have uh, data broken down in all sorts of different ways uh, that you just don't see in other countries. And I guarantee you, when you go and you see the graphs shown uh, in the different media outlets, uh, they, don't, they simply don't mention uh, that half the countries don't report the firearm homicide data. And that rec includes even some developed countries. Okay, so uh, here are the homicide rates for developed countries. Uh, there are uh, 37 uh, full members of uh, something called the OECD, the Organization of Economic and Cooperation Development. Um, and uh, there are two other countries that meet the definition of a developed country, but for political reasons aren't included, Brazil and Russia. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, you can see here, the United States is indeed high. Again, these are homicides, not murder data. The United States is high in terms of uh, homicide rates. Uh, but there are countries, Chile, Russia, Mexico, Brazil, uh, actually in the most recent data, uh, both Brazil and Mexico are a little bit higher, particularly Mexico is about 30 per, uh, per 100,000 people. And um, uh, and you can see here, uh, the United States is high, but it's not the top. And these other countries, you know, it's the reason why they don't include Chile or Estonia or other countries like that, even though they make the meet the definition of what is a developed country. Now, I want to just have a comparison here for a second, then I'll put these different graphs together. Uh, there's something called uh, uh, the small arms survey and uh, this graph is from the New York Times uh, basically it would say if you look among developed countries the same 11 countries that the New York Times reported before the United States has uh, about 89 guns per hundred people Switzerland is about 46 Sweden is 32 and so on now there are a couple things to point out here uh, one is, um, uh, I've been putting this data together uh, across countries. If you actually go and look at the small arms surveys footnotes, what you'll find is that of the 209 countries that they report data for, uh, they only list sources for 25 of those countries. For years, I would go and email them, ask them for the sources of the data, uh, initially, they would go and tell me, oh, sure, we're happy to do it. Uh, we'll send it to you. You know, a week or so would go by. I'd email them again saying, I don't think I've received anything from you. And they'd say, oh, sorry, we've been really busy. We'll get to it. Uh, about a month would go by. I'd email them again. they say, oh, sorry, we've been really busy. And uh, after a couple of years, it was clear that they had no intention of uh, providing me with this information. The small arms survey... I guarantee you, if you see any data uh, in any publication like the New York Times or Washington Post or USA Today on gun ownership across countries, they're using the Small Arms Survey. It's an organization that's been funded in part by Soros. And uh, um, it's a mess. I mean, I when we have been going through it, uh, we spent about $70,000 collecting the data so far. We're not quite done. We have about uh, 80 countries that we've gotten the data for. they are countries that they're off by a factor of 10. And, uh, and there's a problem also with how you collect it. We've been collecting the way they did, number of guns per 100 people. But 
you know, let me give you a simple example. Let's say I have two countries. In one country, 100% uh, of the people own one gun each. In another country, 1% of the country, 1% of the population owns 100 guns each. Both of those are going to show 100 guns per 100 people. But it's not really obvious to me that that's a particularly useful way of looking at it since there, I hope you agree that there's a big difference between uh, having one out of every hundred people own a gun and uh, all people owning a gun. Uh, you know, kind of once you get past your 15th gun, it's not going to make a huge difference in terms of uh, your ability to go and defend yourself. Uh, and there's another problem with this, and that is um, when they're talking about gun ownership, you may not appreciate that or understand, realize this, but there's a difference between gun possession and gun ownership. So uh, when uh, the first of these small arms surveys were done, for example, um, uh, all able-bodied males in Switzerland were mandated to have, uh, who were between 18 and 34, were mandated to have a machine gun in their home, and many of them who were officers were also given handguns. And once you turn 34, uh, you're allowed to apply to remain, remain in the militia. People will very frequently do that up until age 65. And at that point, you're given the option to be able to go and purchase the guns that you've had in your home. Well, the problem is, uh, all those military weapons, they may be in people's homes, but they're not listed in the small arms survey because the government owns the guns. The individuals don't own those guns until they turn 65. Now, is the question really, do we care in terms of dangers of guns or anything else in terms of possession, or do we care in terms of ownership? Uh, another country that this affects fairly dramatically is Israel. Uh, according to the small arms survey, only about, there are only about seven guns per hundred people in Israel. Uh, <clears throat> the problem is uh, the vast majority of guns that are in civilian hands in Israel are technically owned by the government. Uh, so does it matter if you're walking around the streets carrying a, a handgun for protection? Uh, and at times in the past you've had uh, almost 15% of the adult Jewish population uh, li licensed to carry a gun in public. Uh, it's lower now. But uh, uh, does it matter whether the government owns the gun or whether you possess the gun? And it seems to me that's a pretty big difference that's there. <clears throat> so, um, and you can see, you've probably seen these types of graphs before. Uh, this is from Fox. And it will say Americans own a ridiculous number of guns. We make up about 4.4% of the world population, but we have 42% of the guns. This is, <clears throat> this is based on the small arms survey, as you can see. And uh, it's, I don't know what to make of this because uh, it's, it's not a useful, I mean, it's just a number that's pulled out of the air. Look, even the 25 countries that they claim to, that they actually list their sources for are problematic because almost all of them are, are surveys. So when they're putting together gun ownership rates uh, by countries in uh, 2017, uh, a number of their countries are from a 2007 survey in Europe. I don't know how they adjust to go from 2007 to 2017, but... Uh, but there's a more fundamental problem. Uh, I'll just give you an example. In, uh, in Canada, uh, they had a long gun registry uh, that went into effect in the late 1990s. Uh, if you look at surveys of Canadians uh, in the early uh, to mid-1990s, what you'll find is that... Uh, uh, about eight and a half million Canadian uh, adults uh, would tell surveyors that they owned a gun, a long gun. Um, the problem is when they got when they started to talk about passing the law and when they passed it, uh, 
uh, to register the guns, only about three and a half million uh, Canadians registered their guns. Now, and the surveys at that time then began to show only about three and a half million Canadians had long guns. So you're left with options. Did you have at least five million Canadians who claimed that they owned a gun beforehand when they didn't actually own a gun? Maybe it was a macho thing uh, to falsely claim that they owned a gun. Or it could be that uh, when it becomes illegal for you to own guns that you haven't registered, you might be reticent to go and tell a surveyor uh, that you still had the gun. Okay, uh, I'll give you one funny story. I don't know if you guys you guys probably have heard this. Uh, back in the mid 1980s, uh, uh, the UN did a survey across many different countries. And uh, they would ask a whole range of questions. It was a long survey. But one of the questions that they would ask is uh, gun ownership. And they didn't ask this for all countries. But one country that they did ask this for was Russia, where they surveyed 5,000 people. No one, uh, this was the former Soviet Union, no one said that they owned a gun. Uh, if you want to go back and do something fun, what you can do is... is uh, Look at when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 and the civil wars would break out in places like Armenia and Tajikistan and what have you. And you'll find news stories <clears throat> where they'll talk about people pulling guns out of their attics from World War II or World War I or before the communists even took over uh, that uh, they were using in these civil wars that were breaking out. Now, it could be people just forgot that they had the guns in the attic, but uh, apparently there were a number of them that were there. Uh, and so, you know, one can easily imagine that in the former Soviet Union, some people were just reticent to go and tell uh, the government that they owned a gun. All right. <clears throat> so anyway, this is, I'm going to combine the two sets of graphs that we were talking about here quickly. And uh, you can see here, this is guns per 100 people and gun-related deaths. So this also includes suicides here. And they show, and you'll, I'm sure you've seen this type of thing many times, a positive relationship with the United States way out here in terms of gun ownership and uh, high in terms of gun deaths. Okay, <clears throat> I'm just going to show you homicide rates here. And you get a very similar graph. The United States here, this is, even despite all the problems that I've mentioned with all these numbers, I'm just going to show you how sensitive it is uh, to the sets of countries that were just used in the previous graph. Because they don't use all the countries. <clears throat> and there's issues that are there. So this is the small arms survey, measured the way the small arms survey does. And this is homicide rate, not murder rate. <clears throat> Now, um, just to show you, what happens if we asked a different question and asked the question, what can the U.S. learn from other developed countries? And again, using these flawed data that's there that everybody uses, you'll see actually a slight negative relationship between the small arms survey measure of gun ownership and the homicide rate. So just compare these. And it's, I don't know if any of you have taken statistics, but uh, if you run a regression, which is what this line is here, you're minimizing the sum of the squared errors. So if you have something that's an outlier way out here in your, in your uh, measuring, your, your, you have the square of that error, something that's an outlier gets huge weight uh, in terms of the regression. And that's basically what happens. Just this one data point way out here by itself pulls this line right up. <clears throat> okay, well, I'll just mention one other thing, and that is, um, even if we had used this graph, uh, if we fixed the Switzerland and Israel, Israel is over here, measures so that they looked at possession rather than gun ownership, both of those would be something like over 120, 125 uh, guns per hundred people. And those two 
data points way out here by themselves would actually, even with the United States there, would pull that line right back down. So you can see just how uh, the small arms survey just measured two countries there, how much even this graph uh, is dependent upon that. Okay. <clears throat> and as I say, there are other countries that are left out, uh, countries that are OECD members. So if you look at the OECD members, and use the small arms survey, not fixing it, using the homicide rate, uh, again, you get a negative relationship, even with the United States there, because you have these countries that have very low gun ownership rates that have high homicide rates. Now, <clears throat> here's another example of the problem with the small arms survey, and that is... Uh, as I said before, if it were me, I would go and look at the percentage of the adult population that has a gun rather than the number of guns per 100 people. Um, uh, so they claim in this that uh, about 10 out of every 100, uh, there are 10 guns per 100 people in Brazil. There are about 18 guns per 100 people in Mexico. You know, uh, one, I, I think those numbers are nuts, but two, if you were to go and measure it in terms of the percent of the population, adult population with guns, both Brazil and Mexico, you're talking about like one-tenth of one percent of the population are legally licensed to own a gun. I mean, it's kind of mind-boggling. Mexico and Brazil both have homicide rates now that are about six times higher than the U.S. rate, and yet they have just a tenth of one percent. So they'd be way up against this axis here. And that would make this even more uh, negative than it is right now. And you can see here, uh, uh, this is the firearm homicide rate, uh, and it's for uh, uh, the, all the countries that are in the survey. Again, the survey doesn't even have all the countries, even with their kind of made-up data. And uh, you've got a negative relationship there. Or you can see... Um, uh, I'm not even going to go. This is the firearms. Okay, I'm not even going to go through this. So uh, let me just quickly uh, ask you a question. And, and that is, uh, can you name me one place in the world that's banned guns? Any place in the world uh, that's banned either all guns or all handguns and seen the murder rate fall? Because I can't find it. Uh, every single place that's banned either all guns or all handguns, and we have, we have uh, homicide or murder data both before and after the ban to make a comparison, uh, shows that it increases, often by very large amounts. Um, you know, uh, uh, so I'll just show you some graphs here. You know, in the United States, people are kind of familiar with the stories. This is D.C., D.C.'s handgun ban went into effect in February 1977. This is a simple graph, just trying to control for things by comparing D.C.'s murder rate relative to the murder rate in the other 50 largest cities. Chicago's left out, and you'll, uh, that's because they also had a ban put in place. But you can see prior to the ban going into effect, Chicago's uh, murder rate was falling relative to the murder rate in other cities. When the murder rate went, when the ban went into effect, it rose back up, and it continued bouncing around from about 40% to about 80%. After this point, it goes even higher. In Chicago, um, because the modern uh, city data only started back, uh, back around 74, so that's the reason why that starts in 74, um, if you compare Chicago to the other 10 largest cities, uh, Chicago's murder rate was falling consistently uh, right up until uh, through 82. Chicago's handgun ban went to effect in November 1982. Uh, you can see their murder rate was falling relative to other cities and rose and generally was rising over the whole period of time after that. Uh, that the ban was in effect. Now, gun control advocates will basically say um, that uh, it's unfair to go and look at Chicago and Washington, D.C., because unless you have a ban every place, 
uh, people can still get guns from other places. So if, unless you have a ban in Indiana and the rest of Illinois, it's not fair to look at Chicago. And obviously people who could go to Maryland or Virginia and obtain guns, um, you would, uh, uh, you know, so you have to ban everybody. Well, we can look at island nations. Okay, I mean, first of all, it would have been nice if uh, if uh, they had told us before we had the Chicago and, and D.C. bans that they wouldn't work uh, if unless you had to ban every place uh, before they went into effect. But uh, even if that story is somehow true, uh, it doesn't explain why you saw the big increases in murder rates relative to other places. And uh, uh, but even so. Uh, there are places around the world that you can look where whole nations have banned guns. And I'll just show you some for island nations that have banned guns, where we can look before and after the ban went into effect. Uh, and you find a similar pattern. Here is for Ireland. Ireland's uh, gun ban went into effect. This is the Republic of Ireland. Uh, so it's the lower part of the island. Uh, went into effect in 1972. Uh, Ireland's homicide rate was bouncing around right up until uh, the ban, and then it went up. Uh, even if you kind of remove the extreme values here, there's a lot of drug gang violence that's occurring here. Um, it's still much higher on average than it was before the ban went into effect. You can look at uh, Jamaica. Uh, during the 1950s and 60s and early 70s, uh, Jamaica's murder rate was actually very similar to the murder rate in the United States. Their uh, gun ban went into effect in 1975 and it, their murder rate immediately started going up. Now you had some political violence that occurred here and a lot of drug gang violence that occurred here. Again, drug gangs here too. One thing just to point out and that is how incredibly difficult it is to stop uh, illegal drugs from being sold. Uh, and the thing is, uh, just as the drug gangs go and bring in uh, the illegal drugs, uh, they bring in the weapons to go and protect that extremely valuable property that they have. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's not like a drug gang can go to the police and say, look, this other dealer stole our drugs. Can you help us get them back? They have to essentially set up their own little militaries in order to go and protect that extremely valuable property. You know, if I could click my fingers and cause all, all guns in the United States to disappear and all illegal drugs, how long do you think it would be before illegal drugs started coming back into the country? If you're in El Paso, 20 minutes. Uh, and how long do you think it would be before they would bring in the weapons that would be needed to protect that valuable property? They'd be bringing them in at the same time. Uh, you know, Mexico has had one gun store in the country uh, since 1973. It's run by the military. Guns are extremely expensive. Uh, you have to go to Mexico City. It's a very time-consuming process. Uh, and as I say, only about a tenth of 1% of the adult population in Mexico is legally licensed to own a gun uh, because it is so difficult and costly uh, to be able to do that. And yet they have guns all over the place and they're not coming from the United States. Uh, only about 17% of their crime guns have been traced to the United States and I can explain the data if you're interested. So I just want to kind of, there are other things I could talk about here, but I just kind of want to make one thing clear and that is <coughs> there are different ways of looking at the data. When you see most of the discussion in terms of uh, the media, they're looking across places. There are very few academics who look at what we call cross-sectional data. Uh, and that's because it's very difficult to account for different factors. But you know, if you get into a discussion with somebody, somebody's going to say, well, look, compare the UK to the United States. Uh, and they'll say, the UK has very low homicide rate compared to the United States, and um, uh, and they have very strict gun control laws. Uh, handguns have been banned since uh, January '97, uh, and so it must be the strict gun control laws that cause uh, 
the low homicide rate. Here's, and you know, of course, on the other side, people point to Chicago. Um, but here's the problem, and that is the way I would look at this, and I'll show you a graph in a second, is what was the homicide rate in the UK before they had the gun ban? And what you find is that over time, the three major gun control laws that, uh, that the UK has had in 1920, their first gun control law, 1956, 1997, after each of those gun control laws, their murder rate, their homicide rates went up. They were still lower than the United States, but they went up relative to the United States. So let me just show you the graph here. So, <clears throat> whoops. Their, um, uh, their handgun ban went into effect in January 97. You can see their homicide rate was bouncing around beforehand. Afterwards, it went up. Now, there's some funny things about how they measure homicides uh, that we could talk about here, but they started to go back down afterwards. Any way you measure it, it's going to be much higher, even at this state. And uh, one interesting thing is, why, you know, is it just like eight years after the ban goes into effect, then it starts to go back down? Is there a reason? There actually is a simple reason. Within a two-year period of time here, because people were so upset about the amount of crime, they had a 14% increase in the number of police officers. Over a four-year period of time, they had about an 18% increase in the number of police officers. And it's right at that time where you have this huge increase in the number of police officers that the homicide rate uh, goes down in, uh, in there. So the bottom line is, uh, you know, if you look across time in, a different, in different places, in multiple different places, you know, you're, you're controlling kind of for what's somewhat unique about that place. And, uh, and it, you don't want to look at just one place because there's so many different things that are going on. But it, to me, it's very striking that every place in the world that's banned either all guns or all handguns, every time that we have crime data, both before and after the ban, has seen an increase in, in homicide and murder rates. You think out of randomness. You'd get one time where the homicide and murder rates stayed the same, and yet every single time they've gone up. And there's actually a fairly simple explanation for that, and that is when you ban guns, uh, it's the most law-abiding good citizens who turn in their guns relative to the criminals. And to the extent that you, I'm not, you may get some guns away from criminals, but if you primarily disarm law-abiding good citizens relative to criminals, you actually make it easier for criminals to go and commit crimes. And, you know, this doesn't just apply to bans. Any type, you have to be careful. Any type of gun control law that you pass, you have to, you know, whether it's these background checks on private transfers of guns or other things, don't primarily disarm law-abiding good citizens relative to criminals. So anyway, I appreciate your time. I'm happy to go and uh, uh, answer any questions that people have.